and that's one um, sort of scene for covering the Fed. And then there's also millions of people out there with mortgages and car loans who just want to know what does this mean for me. And explaining to those two audiences is a very different thing. I'm going to try and talk about explaining to the latter audience, the, the sort of general, how can you get this across and be broadly accurate rather than the, you know, the stuff which is my day-to-day -day existence. Is this ready? Is, there a, is this the yeah, thing I need to click? Thing, yeah. Can I start now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, and I actually think, not, not to, um, to criticise my distinguished panel, fellow panellists, mm -hmm. but I think this has actually been quite a good illustration for why people misunderstand the Fed and why it's difficult to cover. Because there are these mountains of theory, um, there are political interests in there, there are market interests with people talking their own books, people bringing other things, fiscal policy, structural policy, oh, the weather affected the employment report, and it all turns into this huge blancmange, which, if you're not a, a specialist in this, it's really hard to find a path through it, to you know, actually have a core of sense in this that you can get across to people. So this is how I try to do it. I'm not claiming this is right, I'm not claiming this is good, but you know, this is what, what we've ended up, ended up with. So... The way, the way I suggest trying to get across these things like QE and forward guidance and all the rest of it is just to start with what the goal of it all is. And I, I highly commend this statement to you because I think it's quite hard to be wrong. The Fed today did X, 600 billion of quantitative easing or new forward guidance in an effort to stimulate the economy by driving down longer term interest rates. The wonderful thing about this is it's almost always right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you just flip it around and go the other, way, the other way, the Fed today decided to taper its quantitative easing as it eased off on its effort to stimulate the economy by driving down long-term interest rates. That's also right. And when the Fed comes to raise interest rates or sell assets or whatever else, you just flip this around and, and say, an effort to reduce its stimulus to the economy or to... You know, cut off stimulus to the economy and allow long-term interest rates to go back up again, that will also be broadly right. So I think the best way to start, and all of these things, and I, I, even, I don't think there's much disagreement about this, that's the channel by which it affects the economy. And you can easily translate that to regular people. You know, I don't do this for my audience because they're financial markets people and they care about 10-year bond yields, whatever else. But you know, just say mortgage rates. Everyone understands that. It's meant to make your mortgage rate go up or mortgage rate go down. And that's the simplest way to get it across. And to be honest, if your audience is general, my advice would be don't go into the mechanics. You're just going to complicate things, confuse people and switch them off. And if you want to try and explain it, that's great. And I'm, I think the more people understood this, the better. But just at the simplest level, this is your mortgage rate going up or down. And the mechanics of it, although you get people shouting printing money or whatever else, it really isn't that, and it, it, it really is as simple, simple as this. So anyway, I, I commend that structure to you, explain what they're trying to do, and then if you want to, try and explain how they're trying to do it. So quantitative easing, I pulled this out of some story, we've done it different ways, I'm not claiming this formulation is particularly great. But under QE, the central bank buys long-term assets in order to reduce the supply of long-term assets available to other people. And if there's fewer of them available to investors, well, then the long-term interest rate is going to go down. So this is, after many iterations, the closest we can come to a concise explanation of what QE actually is. The basic idea is there's a bunch of 10-year bonds out there. The Fed buys up some of them. There's few, a few are left for everyone else. And so they're going to compete to buy them, and that's going to drive the interest rate down. It, it, even that is quite a hard idea to get across. And this is, after God knows how many stories about this, um, the closest I've been able to come. A useful idea to introduce at the same time, I think, is that short-term rates are already at zero. So if you explain to people that you know, the Fed's short-term rate is already 0%, then it's kind of easier to explain why they might be trying to mess around with long-term rates. So anyway, this is our effort to explain what QE is. 
and then for forward guidance, yeah. this isn't very good. And I went back and looked at all our stories on forward guidance and was quite disappointed to realise that we never explained it very clearly. Um, but again, I, I pulled this out of another story. And this just says, the goal of a new economic condition. So I think this was the story when the Fed put in the 6.5% unemployment rate threshold to offer reassurance that rates will stay low for as long as the economy remains weak. I think that's about right. You know, the idea is we're going to keep rates low until unemployment gets back down to you know, 5%, 6%, whatever the long-term rate is. Um, I think your average central banker would always want to add a caveat, so long as inflation doesn't so long remain as inflation subdued. Stays well, I, we probably yeah. had that. There's yeah, an inflation yeah, condition. In. It was probably in the story. Yeah. Um, you can bring my, my, my first thing back as well in order to drive down long-term interest rates, because basically the idea is that you know, long-term interest rates are just a succession of short-term oh. interest rates. So if you promise to keep short-term interest rates low for a while, it's just another way of driving down long-term interest rates. So again, it's really difficult to get this across, but I think that idea gives the flavor of something someone might understand. It's just promising to keep rates low until things get better. I think people can probably understand that if they want to engage with it. Things we shouldn't say but often do, printing money, flooding the market with liquidity, injecting money, all of these things have appeared in Financial Times stories. Um, the fact is, and this is something which I think the Fed and other central bankers don't understand particularly well, is that newspapers like sexy language and we like to, you know, say things are happening. So saying that there's some effort to drive down long-term interest <laughs> rates, well, I, you know, I've written that in leads of stories and what usually happens is the editor picks it up and says, uh, you know, $600 billion, billions of dollars, <laughs> and rewrites it to say, the Fed today injected $600 billion of liquidity into the economy. So I, like, I like flooding. 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 <laughs> well, it's interesting. They all tend to be liquid-related metaphors. <laughs> and it, it, this is a real fact that, that all over financial markets, you will see these liquid-related metaphors, flows and stuff in coverage of it. And there's a reason we do that, because it conveys a sense of motion and things happening. And so, to be honest, I have sympathy for us journalists when we use things like this. Um, and I didn't, I, mean, I wouldn't say don't do it in some ways, just understand it's not right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, not only is it not right, it's wrong. <laughs> well, it, it, it's led to a great deal of confusion. It has led to a great deal of confusion. I hope, uh, and that's why I say don't do it, but at the same time... you got to get readers. Well, you've got to get readers, but also in, in one sense it is correct, because there is a flow of buying by yeah. the US. Yeah. It is it's moving liquidity around the financial system, even if it's not that's creating right. it. So, so it, I guess my, my take would be trying to avoid it, but recognize that it's not actually right. And to see why it's not right, I mean, Jim's already shown versions of these two charts. I just pulled, did them very quickly. But you know, this is GDP and the monetary base, which is yet another of these technical terms, which you know, it's useful to understand, but you've got to do a degree in economics to really get any of this anyway. So it's pointless to, to worry about it too much. But, you know, this is the growth of GDP and the growth of the monetary base. And you can look at these things and say that there's some relation between these two things. They're not totally disconnected, and you can see why people would want to say, well, you know, the Federal Reserve increases the monetary base, and that has some connection with the increase in the total size of the economy. Not This is unadjusted for inflation. But then we get, this is, runs up to 2007, and we get to 2007, and suddenly this chart doesn't look very helpful anymore. So, you know, the monetary base expands vastly, and the economy doesn't really do anything, and I could have done inflation, it, you've seen broadly the same thing. So, and this is why I think um, it's best to avoid, and I, I, and I very much agree with Jim. So, I, I guess, um, go back, we'll end this. Um, so, just in terms, my last comment, in terms of the controversy, which I think Jim represented one side of, and Sri represented another side of, to some degree, you know, it's actually about a dozen interlinked controversies all rolled up into one quite hard to explain and understand controversy. And a lot of agreement. I mean, you both seem to be saying that Fed policy has been ineffective. I suspect that they 
probably would disagree about yeah. that. But yeah. Yeah. maybe we'll we'll leave that for Q and A. Right. So just let, let me make the last point. Um, the idea that QE doesn't work through floods of liquidity, and that yeah. it probably has had some broad effect on lowering interest rates, and that may have helped the economy, is. I would say the consensus view, certainly of central banks and of most mainstream academic economics, um, there are certainly academic economists who think otherwise, and a lot of people in financial markets who think otherwise. But if you're going to report the controversy, then I think it's quite important to point out that at least there's a central bank and sort of academic economic consensus that what the Fed's doing works roughly the way the Fed says it does. Um, so I advise extreme caution in trying to report this. It's like any number of you know, science issues like nuclear power or global warming and stuff. I mean, there are differences of opinion, but there's also a consensus, I think, which points one way. But that's my view, and you know, Shri may disagree. Anyway, that's it from me. And I'm sure that everyone's been waiting very patiently for a long time to ask questions and talk. So, it, is, my understanding is that the Fed uses targets to try and make their policy, and it's passe now that they use the monetary base as a target. It's my understanding. That used to be maybe, maybe when Friedman had more influence, but that had shown evidence suggested that view and that tool was wrong. And now they target interest rates and inflation rates, mainly interest rates, but also inflation rates. That's what they use to target their policy. Is that correct? Uh, if so I can take that, absolutely. I think the Fed has said uh, most recently that 6.5% uh, unemployment is where they may start to lower the interest rate. That is, that's the forward guidance. May start to raise. But I'm sorry, it's start to raise. So it will not you. raise until. So it will not raise until the federal uh, the unemployment rate is six and a half percent. But it's not quite a guidance to you to to hang your hat on, because they in turn say based it is data dependent, and if there are other data that come forth which do not support an increase in interest rates, six and a half can come and go. You can go to six point four and six point three, and you will not raise interest rates. So what have you told me about the six and a half percent? Not much. You didn't tell me you will raise it. You haven't told me you will not raise it. But you have created more confusion in the market in the process. That's the first part. So my recommendation is rather than use the so-called U3 unemployment rate, the rate which went down from 7% to 6.7, is to use a broader measure of unemployment rate, which is known as the U6. It includes frustrated workers who have left the workforce because they don't have jobs, people who are working part-time because they can't find full-time jobs, that figure is at 13.1% in December, unchanged from November. Hasn't fallen very much after the recession. So if you do want the quantitative easing to be based on the employment side, use that as a better measure than the U3. Second, second recommendation for the target is it is falling off because the participation rate, which is the part of the workforce, the labor involvement of the population, is in the lowest level today since 1978. And the defense of that, which I disagree with, is some Fed members, whenever you have a number which doesn't agree with whatever you're forecasting, you blame the weather or you blame something else. In this case, it is demographic trends and the population is getting older. But if you look at the people 45 to 54 years old, they've always been 45 to 54. They've not gotten older. That section, the participation rate has fallen significantly in December compared with November, which says to me that it is indeed a cyclical phenomenon rather than a demographic longer term phenomenon. So as far as the Fed is concerned, if they ought to take the participation rate drop also into account because you don't want to lower unemployment rate by kicking more people out of the workforce. Let you me, want to do it by creating jobs. But let me say that this is just precisely what the Fed has explained it, it is doing. So yeah. so we agree that was a, a good exposition of what we are in fact doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I would say on the interest rates, by the way, they have always, their, in terms of their policy tools, have always been focused on setting interest rates. That's always been the policy. When I went in 79, 
we pretended to target non-barred reserves in the money supply, but it was mm -hmm. always kind of changing around. The, 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 tru the truth is, as Bill Poole showed in early work, if you're uncertain what's going on in the financial sector and demand for money is all over the place, yeah. you, you, you stick with interest rates. They've always done it. They, in beginning in 1982, they began to acknowledge that they had a Fed funds target. And so it's always been, that's been the main policy tool. The others you watch because you always want to understand is there something going on? But it, and, in, and in terms of the ultimate goals, you know, Janet Yellen, you're going to hear a lot more about this. There, there's nobody is wedded to any one measure. They're looking at structural un unemployment, part-time unemployment. It's mainly young people who have vanished from the job market, mm -hmm. get out of college, can't get a job, you disappear, mom and dad are helping you. So they are, they are watching that situation. And at the end of the day, the clue to all of this, this is all really an intermediate step for trying to understand what's going to be happening to, to inflation. If we discovered, for example, that uh, the labor, you know, the labor market continues to improve, unemployment is coming down, but inflation is not going up, the focus is going to shift much more intensively on the inflation target. Because at the end of the day, that's the ultimate goal. When you talk about this participation rate, you're talking about that 62.8 or whatever it was. 62.8, okay. correct. Yeah. Yeah. The the last yeah. time it was December was 62.8, November was 63, October was 62.8. And to pick up under the 62.8, you have to go to 1978. Although, now that, that the, the participation rose steadily for many years, and then for demographic reasons, and because uh, a, a large share of women entered the labor force, and so that continually increased participation until that reached a kind of level that it was going to stay at. Uh, and then for de demographic reasons, as the share of the labor force that's old uh, goes, goes up, it, it's going to go down. So we know that uh, for very good reason, it was going to go up and it was going to go down. Now, but I agree then, that's just a general story so you understand the background. Uh, the fact that it's the lowest since 70 something is neither here nor there, that's, that's, that is demographics. What happened in December though is something to be very concerned about yes. because that isn't, that is, demographics are long, slow moving things and so I agree with the, uh, I just wanted to add the caveat about history, but I agree with that we have to look at in any given month. It's not uh, demographic. Right. Just know no, that I, any one any one month's number, particularly when it doesn't make sense, is often doesn't make sense, and it's often well, there's we'll an aberration month, in the numbers. We'll I, I, you could be. You know, you don't want to be, especially when you find large yeah. numbers of people that were not on the job or part time because of bad weather. You got to you got to give it some time. One month numbers are not a trend. I, yeah, the, you, the you thing that worries me is that in it. Uh, if you were watching CNBC or Bloomberg at 8.25 in the morning, everybody is super optimistic five minutes before it comes out. And people on the networks would remain unnamed. So I, it, it comes to about 8.31 now. And then there is shock at the 74,000. Yeah. The immediate response is ignore this number. So you will take into account only numbers which are favorable to your forecast. Second, you say it is because of weather. You didn't know it was cold in December. And you didn't know that at 825, but you found out at 831 that it was cold in December. So the point being when you have, and then look at the others. This is true, market participants, by Aver the way. <laughs> <laughs> Average wages in the U.S. economy increased by 1.8%. That's because of weather over one year? No. The average work week went down in December. That's not due to weather. There were lots of indicators which suggest that the labor market is weak. So when it doesn't agree with the people's forecast, it's always something else. But and but let me say that he, that Sri is really expositing the very much the view that you'll hear around the board table in every meeting we have. You can't. It's not that you discount any number. You don't put too much emphasis on any one number, whether it's consistent, better than you'd hope for, worse than you'd hope for. You don't put too much emphasis on it. Uh, uh, but that you have to consider this broad range of you have to con you'll hear again and again and if you look in FOMC statements you'll see it this broad range of participation different measures of unemployment uh, and underemployment and that is that's very that that is uh, talking uh, the, the Fed's book I think uh, and I completely agree. So if the if the monthly job numbers are so um, volatile or you know you can't take one number to the bank et cetera why not just release a quarterly number. Why release a monthly number? We need information. The market, uh, you could do that, but you'll have the market trying to discover. We want as much information as possible. Somebody would be trying and to reverse engineer it, setting up a firm to, you know, figure out what the number must be by that by that point. ADP. You know, and look and look what happened. Th things get revised all the time. So right, traders are always complaining to me. Why can't I go back and revise my P and L? Uh, 
look what happened in September. The market thought the Fed was going to start the tapering. The job numbers came out a little on the squishy side. The Fed balked and postponed. Then it turned out that the, in the next round we got some upward revisions and the whole picture looks totally different now. And in fact, uh, the economy grew 4% in the third quarter and now it looks like it might be growing 3 or 4% in the fourth quarter. So the problem is we're, you, we're, we know that, we're used to that kind of thing. And, and, the, and the problem is over time you'll get people dismissing stuff if it doesn't make sense to them. And that's why you know you have to you have to live with the volatility. That's the way it is. So so in, in, I was going to ask what yeah, what you think about well, this. I was gonna any say, given number thing. Well, so as a journalist, if we get a nice number which is big or small, then we will write it up in yeah. exciting, dramatic <laughs> terms, and that's Using what we floating. exactly that's what <laughs> yeah. we should do. Um, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the quarterly, the point about quarterly numbers, in a sense, you do because you just take the last three months yeah, and then you've got average. a rolling quarterly number. And I believe that the Fed does that, and certainly quite a lot of yeah sure. do that. We try to report that number now. It's something we've started doing recently. Is we try and report the three month average, just because it doesn't bounce around so much. The other point <laughs> in answer to your question is there are also huge revisions a month later. November was two hundred and three, became two hundred and forty one thousand. So which are you going to believe? The 241,000 is a very good number, got just ignored because you don't look at the, uh, the revised numbers. You look at something who, that Who is you? The press or the Fed or who are you talking the about? Market. Because it's not the Fed. No, oh, the, the market, market may. Okay, fine. No, I'm, I'm yeah, 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 completely yeah, yeah. from the market perspective. Okay. In defense of the market, I think it's done a whole lot better job in recent decades than it used to in terms of understanding how much is noise, how much is not, and trying to balance numbers. There's lots of different spe perspectives coming at you. So sometimes, I think the, it used to be the market would be all over the map. And I think over time, we, we learn, like everybody else, uh, how to think about this flow of information that's coming at you. Question down here. So the Fed sort of suffuses everything, all the hard news I write about, retail sales today, jobs Friday. What are some of the, what should I be looking for in enterprise stories? What, what are things that are not being covered? What, you know, what labor force participation is one of them? What are some of the other things we should be doing deeper dives on? Well, the big issue, and you're going to be hearing more about this from Janet Yellen's era, is, is trying to understand what's going on with the labor market because there's a lot of hidden unemployment. And where we keep expecting that this is going to start coming back in. A lot of it's youth, a lot of it's 25 to 35 year olds. And I own a couple, so I know what the story is about. Mm -hmm. And so I think what Jan what they're trying to figure out is we, it does not make sense to Has us. that been a good investment for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for the unemployment rate to be coming down as rapidly as it has is because the labor force disappears. Some of, it's re some of it is because people retire, but the large bulk of it is young people. Uh, the markets, uh, the, the, the opportunities weren't there, so they were doing other things. Some are working at NGOs in Africa, some are teaching English, some went back to school. So to me, trying to get a better handle on Trying to get stories about that captures that population, what's going on with them, what are they doing, that would be very helpful because that's what the Fed, the Fed is going to be spending a lot of time. We don't we don't believe what we're seeing in the labor market data. Is that household formation? That um, it's tied up with yes. us, yes, very yeah. much. But if you if you constantly, would there have been a couple stories you guys done? I've uh, gotten people connected to some of the kids who are. If you graduated the class of 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, you're this story. If you can figure out where there's like three million people who vanished, if you look at their labor force participation rate, it's dropped since 2007. This is not a structural problem. This is unless unless you can convince me that a 28 year old has figured out they're going to go retire. So that's that's a real big deal to try to figure out. Um, I think another part of the labor market is the unprecedented level of long term unemployment of, of, of yeah. any age. Uh, w what's going on in those folks' lives, and do they, if the economy picks up again, what... Uh, could they uh, ever recover? It could, could they recover? See, Are they, recover have they kept their job skills? That's yeah. going to be a, uh, that's yeah. going to be a, another big uh, question. The, the job skill misman... Uh, our, a lot of our businesses are manufacturing. You get the feeling something dramatic happened in the last 10 years. So a lot of our guys are complaining, I got jobs, but I don't have people who have the skills. So there's a lot, there's a, there's a skill gap in there for manufacturing companies. But, and part-timers. Yeah. Part-timers are a real big deal. But that tends to disappear if the economy starts it, growing. It, it, yeah, this was much, this was off the charts. The normal amount of part-time people 
is about 4 million people, part-time for economic reasons. In six months, between 2008 and the spring of 2009, it doubled. And that's come down a little bit, but th so it's getting all wrapped up in this political debate about is this affordable care or is it really uncertainty about the economy? And, and sharing, I try to understand also, what that's about would be really helpful. But it's also a sharing economy. Yeah. You know, it's the Uber driver. Kind yeah. Of thing Every time we have a period of high unemployment rates for any sustainable length of time, people bring up the thing there's a skills gap. And it usually never pans out because once the economy starts going again, yeah. employees know how to get it, those skills up. For those this is a little workers. different because you've had massive innovation in the, in the last 15 years. Plus, you've got all this globalization going on, and so it's construction and the shock to our real estate yeah. problem and the manufacturing sector probably has created more of a I've structural heard that story issue. Before. I've heard it. I've heard it in the uh, 50s. I've heard it in the 70s, and it didn't never panned out. Once the economy was going, the unemployment rate went down. Look yeah, no, it's, well, it's been coming down. The it's, it's the problem it's, is yeah, very slowly, part. very slowly, yeah. and some of it's because people are getting discouraged yeah. and leaving yeah. the labor force. No, I. I would say watch, as you said, Jim, watch the long-term unemployed. I, December 2007, when the recession began, it was 1.2 million. Right now, it's 3.9. So we are, if you ask, how do you measure an economic recovery, those people, they have not seen a re recovery from the recession. Stock market, yes. But long-term unemployed, there has not been any recovery. They have seen no benefit from the quantitative easing. The two others are what I said earlier. Uh, in I would definitely say youth unemployment, the youth that you focused on, uh, Jim. And in addition to that, would add on the U6 unemployment rate, which is a f much better measure of unemployment than U3. U3, I think, is essentially useless. It is helpful for political purposes in terms of you can say it's improved. I can say it didn't improve. And nobody can prove you or me wrong. So it, that's, it has help on the political side, but doesn't help evaluate the economy quite seriously. So I think U6 would be one. And two more would be to watch whether wages are starting to rise. They should, mm -hmm. if it is a healthy labor market. You have to question, unemployment fell to 6.7%, but wages didn't grow much. So that's a danger signal. And the last point is... A danger, well, an encouraging and a danger signal, right? It's, just, it's danger that, that it, it may be time to... Uh, you mean that it stayed flat is a danger signal? No, it is a uh, it is a danger signal that the wages have remained relatively oh, yeah, yeah. flat. And when it rise, when it starts to rise, that's that's great news, and it's, it's yeah. a sign that it right. yes, yeah, exactly. It's funny that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And the last part being uh, the average hours worked during the work week, and what you find is that that starts to creep up and quite significantly before employment is ramped up. So it's almost like an early indicator, early signal that the labor market is improving. And you get negative vibes from that measure as well, which is why I don't like blaming the weather because there are this whole host of statistics which are pointing in the other direction. Sometimes you can get cues by listening to what is affecting the Fed's thinking about the economy. So if someone highlights capital spending has been kind of surprisingly soft. So picking up little things from that, it's a little more boring because then you got to sort of act like an economist and try to figure out what's affecting their forecast. But you can sometimes get clues from... They, they sometimes highlight for you things that are on their mind that, 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 that we're all sort of mystified by. All right. Well, this gentleman has yeah. If we, we look at the official um, rate of inflation, right, it's about a little below 2%. And if it's we look 1%. At 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%
as their living standard rises, their natural tendency, people tell me, is you buy gold. That's what form of saving. So there's all kinds of things going on. But I think the heart of it has been this this worry about uh, governments getting into debt problems and central banks doing aggressive, you know, asset purchases. And so there was this fear. Art Laffer, what he told, what he warned of four years ago, the fear was there was going to be this buildup of inflation that reminded people of what they saw in the Weimar Republic, the hyperinflation. Or at least when Reagan was president. My, yeah. my answer to your question, which I think is very valid, would be two or threefold. One is uh, the, the dollar is being created at the will of the Federal Reserve. Russia has nothing, no say in it. They are just forced, it is stuffed down their throat That's in right. some sense. In reserve. So they are diversifying. One way would be to look at gold as an alternative because it can go up or down in price, but no central bank is determining the quantity of it. So that's the big advantage. The second uh, development that is taking place, which is it began between Brazil and China about two years ago, they developed a hundred billion US dollars worth of swap facility for exports. Since both of them are export giants, they decided to pay each other in their own currencies. So let's, I don't need to hold $100 billion of paper cash, export goods to the United States, get that cash just for the sake of paying the Chinese. So the Brazilians can pay in reais, the Chinese can pay in renminbi, and we can avoid the dollar, which in turn, long term, leads to higher U.S. interest rates because the dollar's role is reduced. That's the second way in which they are changing. The third is... If you look at some of the central banks, and China has entered into swap facilities, both with the Bank of England and with the European Central Bank, both within the last couple of months, yeah. which means, once again, they are going to bypass the U.S. dollar, and they are dealing with each other in terms of non-dollar currencies. So the, if you look at what happened until 1918, the British pound was the dominant currency in the world. There was no parallel. And then it shared the status with the dollar till 1945. The, the pound sterling lost its status after 45, it became only the dollar. I'm this, you have a good, starting to see a gradual move away take place, and what you mentioned about the Russian reaction is one component in the entire development. But it's a little bit contradictory if you think about it. If we have an official um, interest, an official inflation being at one, two percent, why would players want to move? And, 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 you know, my answer, my, my opinion on that is um, it's, it's likely to be higher. Exactly. I agree. Well, at some point in the future, people are anticipating the, the sphere of the Weimar Republic. Uh, th those folks are thinking that there's at least some chance that it'll be higher in the future. That, and, uh, uh, and it's the, uh, it's the Fed's mandate to try to make that not be true. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Between yeah. sixty five percent of trade flows are denominated in dollars and about sixty five percent of reserve a central bank reserves asset allocation is dollars. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, that's not a coincidence. Right? But, but excuse me, to add on to that, UBS had a study uh, about two years ago where they said that UK and United States both have the highest chance for hyperinflation. Now US and UK. UBS yeah, and UK. UBS. Yes. UBS, UBS. <laughs> what all countries were included in that? <laughs> They looked, they looked, oh, you know. And we had Zimbabwe and. Okay. <laughs> All right, on well, that. Great, great work. We've really got a great wrap. discussion to have, but offline, maybe we, you yeah, we are going to wrap it up, so. and if you have further questions, you can uh, try to grab these folks in the lobby. Some of them have to get out of here. I want to thank all of our guests so much for being here. Stacey, thank so you so much.